welcome to the Ephesiology Podcast on a brand new 10-week series, Innovative Disruption, recalibrating our mission to the movement of God. We are joined as always by Michael, our resident Ephesiologist, and I'm Andrew Johnson, a pastor at Neartown Church in Houston, Texas. You have joined us for our third episode in this series, and today we're actually launching into the second half of the critical foundation we covered last week, Reorient to Jesus. So, uh, Michael, for those who either are joining us at part two and didn't check out part one, uh, what's what's a quick summary? Where have we been in this idea of reorienting to Jesus so that we can achieve or get to innovative disruption? Well, just a quick summary on this is uh, looking at John's awesome description of Jesus in Revelation chapter one, because the the question is, or the issue is, how do we view Jesus right at this moment? And uh, we're not saying that we don't want to look at the gospels and and what he did and who he was, how you know his human form uh, in those narratives that we have. Um, But we're asking the question, who is he right at this moment? If we were to meet him today, who is it that we'll be meeting? And uh, I think John gives us that picture in Revelation chapter one, when he hears a voice and he turns and he looks and he sees one as the son of man. And here, of course, he's making not only a reference back to Daniel, but I think perhaps even more so, he's making a reference back to the gospel that he wrote, where mm-hmm. he talks about Jesus as the Son of Man. And so we talk about that a little bit in the last podcast, but we get to that just um, incredible response of John, that he falls at Jesus' feet as right. though dead. And then Jesus does two things. He first reaches out and he touches John, and he says to John, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Hmm. And so um, that image, the, the words, fear not, I am, are words that John was familiar with, with as he, uh, I'm sure, is recalling those same words as Jesus was approaching him and the disciples on that stormy sea in Galilee, where Mm -hmm. Jesus tells them to fear not, I am. I remember when we came off of that podcast last week, I just, uh, I was so excited. I was so encouraged just remembering all that the the idea of saying fear not i mean shoot i'm a 90s kid right no fear like it was everywhere it was like the thing plastered all over for adrenaline junkies and you know no fear the the idea of fear not already has great weight to it but it's what is all within i am Mm. to like I commented last week, uh, it's not just like when you ask, uh, who is Jesus now? To say that he is the resurrected Jesus is absolutely accurate and true, but also, as you reminded me, but he's also glorified mm-hmm. and he is reigning and he is this warrior king. So when he says, I am, he's saying it from that place. And saying it from that place is even all the more encouraging and exciting that he is reaching out, not just to John, but to us as well. Yeah. Yeah. And they are encouraging words. And I think they're especially encouraging to John where he is. Remember, he's in, he's on the island of Patmos. Um, We don't know exactly what he was doing there. We know uh, that, uh, He was exiled to that island. We know that there are silver mines on the island, so it could be that he was put to labor in those silver mines. Um, But whatever the case, the the times are tense 
uh, there's social upheaval, uh, and not just because of the Christians and and you know a, a perceived persecution, but the times are are just tumultuous. You know, John is writing around uh, the time of the the Jewish wars, uh, probably a little bit after the Jewish wars. Um, uh, or around that time frame, at least we think, or at least I think that John goes to Asia Minor and ultimately is exiled to Patmos because he's fleeing that uh, social upheaval between the Jews and the Romans in mm -hmm. in Judea. Um, but there are are tenuous times in Asia Minor as well, as we uh, know of the growth of emperor worship. And, and so there's political tensions, there's economic tensions there, along with the social and the religious tensions. And so to, for John to hear Jesus, but hear, not just hear him with his ears, right. but to feel his touch, uh, as well, that those two things, I think, were very meaningful to John at this time. And so in chapter one of Revelation, we have John seeing the glorified king, the son of man. We we have him hearing these words of encouragement. Uh, and so uh, Revelation is a one chapter book, and that's how it finishes. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know what? Uh, yeah, and I and I think I'd be remiss if I didn't connect this to us today. Uh, th this idea of fear not, I am, a and uh, I think it gives us great courage. You know, we have the wonderful privilege to work with people in many parts of the world where they're genuinely experiencing persecution, um, and. Uh, and these words, I think, are so important for them to hear as well as coming from Jesus himself to them, that he is saying that because of who he is, that he is God, uh, we have nothing to fear. And so there's courage there. But it, it's in its context in the first century, they were meaningful words for the seven churches that John is addressing in in the book of Revelation, and uh, and and I think that can't escape us either. It can't. It shouldn't. Um, I was. I had myself on mute. Sorry for the dead air there, um, because I was trying to to pull up the passage in my Bible um, it, immediately before this this vision that John has of the son of man. And I think as rightly so connecting it to us and who we are today. Um, John is, he addresses the seven churches that he's about to write. So he addresses the seven churches. Then he explains the vision and then come these letters uh, that pop in, in chapter two and three. Um, but I did want to read them just because, uh, this is just so encouraging. Uh, John chapter one, verse four, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who was, who is, and who was, and who is to come. Mm -hmm. And from the seven spirits who are before this, his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the Kings on earth. So this is who he is to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Like it just is pause there on verse five to him who loves us mm -hmm. and who has freed us from our sins. You know, this is so much so about that comfort that, that Jesus coming and saying, fear not, I am. This is not from just the uh, ruler who's coming to conquer. It's the ruler who is coming, who is conquering and also tells us, that he loves us mm -hmm. and he has freed us uh, picks up again. Verse six. And he has made us a kingdom priests to his God and father that this is hearkening back to that idea from Exodus chapter 19, that we have been called to be a kingdom of priests. That was always the goal for God's people 
that he would make them into a kingdom of priests ties in again in first john chapter two again we see this here this is our identity this mm -hmm. is who we are that we have actually been called to be a kingdom of priests sent out to represent him to the world and as we talked about last week uniting all things in jesus right you being united in christ is everything um uh priest to his god and father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen i just there is there's so much excitement that is built into something that is true not just to the addressees uh at the time but for his people who have also been called to follow him and to grow as his kingdom mm -hmm. of priests. So as we launch in to these letters, I just want us to hold those things true in mind that this isn't just something that is true or good for uh, the church in Sardis or the church in Pergamum. But these are things that we must grasp onto because these are Jesus words for us as well. Yeah. 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 And they, they are Jesus's words for us. And they were Jesus's words, as you said, for these churches and, uh, and so meaningful for these churches. And so John describes Jesus uh, as the one that he sees walking among the seven golden lampstands, that he's like mm -hmm. the son of man, that he's dressed in a long robe with a golden sash that his hair of his head is is white the eyes his eyes are like flames of fire his feet like burnished bronze his voice like a roar of many waters and in his hand are the seven stars out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword and his face uh, was like the sun shining in full strength and, and and so these are not just this isn't just John's description it is John's description but it's even right, more it's yeah. and and what I love about this is that this is also Jesus's description of himself and so each of the seven letters that he writes to these churches Ephesus Smyrna Pergamum Thyatira Sardis Philadelphia and Laodicea he begins with a description of who it is that's writing the writing the letter mm -hmm. and so to ephesus he says the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks among the seven golden lampstands again he's drawing from how john has just described jesus and jesus now is describing himself in the same way so this is uh who jesus is and so to Smyrna, he writes, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. To Pergamum, he writes, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. And to Thyatira, the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. And to Sardis, he says, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And then to Philadelphia and Laodicea, he seems to add more to his description. Um, certainly, he's the one who uh, holds the keys, who opens and no one can shut, as he says to the church in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And to Laodicea, he is the words uh, of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. And, uh, and so now we have not only John's description of who he sees, mm -hmm. but Jesus's self-description. This is who he is. And it's reassuring to those seven churches who, like John, are experiencing social turmoil, political upheaval, economic hardship, religious tensions. And uh, and he wants the churches to know, just like he wants John to know, fear not, I am the first and the last, and so on. So for, I mean, I don't know if we want to, to go into absolutely every church here and the significance of, you know, each of each of these letters, it's not just, I, I think there's a, there's even a bit of an encouragement to that uh jesus words how he reveals himself to each of these churches is wonderful 
and and enlightening. But how he reveals himself to each of these churches is also specific to each of these churches, isn't it? Like how he describes himself is is unique to them and an encouraging thing to them more than just um, encouraging generally to everybody. I don't think I'm making myself clear, but you're nodding your head as if something is clear <laughs> in there. Yeah, well, something's clear in there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Jesus is describing himself to these churches individually. But we also have to keep in mind that the the apocalypse, the revelation of of actually, it's the revelation of Jesus to John. Um, that uh, it's a complete book, uh, it, and so the all of these churches would ultimately have access to this book. So they would each be able to read the letters that Jesus had written to them. But what's interesting about the seven letters, uh, I think, is just how much attention Jesus gives to each of the churches addressing specific issues in each of those churches. And and those are important mm -hmm. uh, that we see that. And, and one of the encouraging things, I guess, that I see in those seven letters is that Jesus knows what's going on in those churches. And he uses language uh, that m makes it clear that he knows what's going on in those churches. And so he's connecting with those each of those churches in very unique ways. And, uh, and you're right, we can't get into all of those. We do have a course on the book of Revelation yep. that I'd encourage people to look at. We have a, there's a free version of that as well. I think it's called Rediscovering Jesus in Revelation. But, um, but it is so encouraging that Jesus knows who we are. He knows our circumstances. Um, he, he wants us to be connected to him and for us to rightly understand who he is so that we can stay true uh, to our witness. And that's that's what the book of Revelation really is about. I love, we had Scott McKnight uh, several months on the podcast, mm -hmm. and I loved how he talked about the book of Revelation as being a book of dissident disciples. And, uh, and that's what it is. It's it, it, repeatedly, it's a call to uh, aligning ourselves with who Christ is and being faithful in our witness uh, of him in, in difficult times. And, uh, and so the words of Jesus to the churches and the words of Jesus to John are so encouraging and reassuring for us as uh, we're living in, in you know, difficult circumstances. And I think, I think I'm in my growing years, I think I'm coming to realize that it seems that every year is a difficult year or every every season is a difficult season and in in one way uh whatever we are experiencing is a lot less unique than we probably at least thought it was long ago or at least in our younger years everything was rosy and oh man things got hard this has to be the hardest time in human history and then we see it's it's not um however i also mean to say because we are not unique, that's actually an encouraging thing because that means that Jesus' words to churches throughout time who are going through their difficult seasons, as you said, they apply to us and our difficult mm -hmm. season because of the things that they experienced and Jesus meeting them in that exact moment. As you reminded us, Jesus is meeting us in our exact moment. He is not just uh, extending words of encouragement from afar or from a, 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 a bygone past, but he is present with us, that the, the God of all creation, who, who was the, <laughs> the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who mm -hmm. walks among the seven golden lampstands, he is with us today as that same revealed God. He, he's yeah. with us. The thing I wanted to ask you, Michael, as we think about this God um, who is present, who is with us, and, and we take this very intentional step towards him, 
to reorient ourselves to Jesus. Again, to recap what we talked about last time, it doesn't mean if we're reorienting to Jesus that previously we have abandoned him, we've been running against him, and I guess we're going to get around to finally looking at him. We're not saying that. We're just saying we're reprioritizing our focus and running towards him as that foundation, seeing him as that foundation, living as if he is that foundation. How is doing this, Michael, how is that even getting us in the direction of innovative disruption? And I don't know if I'm jumping chapters. I don't know if I'm jumping future lessons, but how is this connecting to where we're wanting to go? Yeah, well, I'd like the question. And of course, I'm saying that because I'm trying to think of the answer here. Perfect. But I mean, we're, we're working from the premise that First, we have to understand who Christ is. If, if, we, if we move forward in the way in which we do missions or ministry, the way in which we do church, without having a real uh, foundation of who Christ is, and, and that foundation being who he is at this moment, then we run the risk of creating Jesus in our image, which will then create our mission, our ministry in our image and create our church in our image. And I think the way in which this sometimes has played out in our time is uh, the number of instances where we'll hear of churches creating their own vision and their own mission statements. And I, I'm always puzzled by that and scratching my head and wondering, don't we know what Jesus's mission is? for the church? Or do we think that uh, we, we are the actual builders, the creators of the church, so that now we have to come up with our own vision and mission for the church? And, uh, and I understand, you know, the influence of the business world on these types of things. It was very popular in the 80s and 90s for us to think about, whether in business or church, to think about mission statements and vision statements and so on. Mm -hmm. This was kind of the business thing to do. And, uh, and, and yet, I think reorienting to Jesus helps us to see that it isn't our mission. It's His mission. He is the builder of the church. And uh, we are a part of that. And so we're called not to create our own mission or our own vision, but Jesus reorienting ourselves to Jesus helps us to see that we're on his mission and we're to do the things that he did uh, on his mission. And, uh, and so I think that's why it's important for us to spend the time uh, to really developing uh, a good, solid Christology, and uh, and then moving from that then to what it is we do. How do how do we then connect Christ in our conversations with people, um, and, uh, and and what does that look like then ultimately as it's expressed in the body of Christ, living as He lived um, today. I think. Uh, for those listening, Michael did eventually get to my answer nice and succinctly at the end and also simultaneously said, but didn't say, these are things that we are going to tease out in the coming weeks as we continue on through some of these steps in our 10 week series, because each of those need a bit more of a description, each more of those, again, kind of the what we do. Um, that's going to take, a, that's going to be explained more fully. So I was jumping the gun a little bit and that's okay. I can handle that. I can handle that. Michael, as far as where we are today and reorienting to Jesus, is there anything more on this tree that we need to shake uh, <laughs> and, and make sure that we fully take on or listen to or to reorient ourselves even more fully to Jesus before... Uh, we say, hey, this is a great foundation, and now we're going to launch into kind of what gets built onto that foundation. Yeah, well, I mean, there's always going to be more to say, isn't there? 
Uh, and let me see if I can put it in this way. Um, I, I think there are four things that we can say here, and this will set us on a path to where we're headed. Perfect. Uh, one is first, uh, we need to understand what in Latin is often called the missio dei. Uh, what is that exactly? And uh, because sometimes we think of it as uh, God's mission, and certainly that is a uh, acceptable translation of missio dei. Missio is the the Latin word uh, that was used to translate the Greek word uh, uh, apostello to send, and um, and then dei, of course, is the Latin word for for uh, the Greek word theos um, for God. And so, literally, missio dei is the sending of God. And, I, and, and so I think a part of what we're trying to do is to, to think about what is that sending of God or God's mission? What, what, what is he sending to? And, uh, and so having a proper understanding of God actually self-sending, that, that he is on a mission, and that mission is to, uh, to be reconciled to people, that he, and he's constantly doing that. That he is always self-sending, and from Genesis chapter one to Revelation chapter twenty-two, it, we can see this God who is sending Himself to engage people, uh, th those who He has created, and so we have the beautiful um, picture of Him sending Himself into the garden in, in Genesis chapter three, for example. And uh, at a point when, when you think maybe all things are lost, Adam and Eve rebel against God. They want to become like him. And then their, their uh, eyes are open and they're full of shame and guilt. I think we can use both of those words in relationship to what Adam and Eve are experiencing. Um, guilt for what they've done and shame for who they've become, that here God sends himself into the garden and he calls out for Adam, where are you? And certainly we can't think that God didn't know where they were, but he wants them to identify themselves and where they are in, uh, in uh, compelling them to come into a relationship with him. But all through, I mean, that's a beautiful picture of the Missio Dei, of God sending himself to a place where so often, you know, I think those of us who have grown up in, in Western uh, Christianity, and by Western Christianity, I mean uh, not only that expressed in the Western world, but even the Christianity that has been formed in uh, by Western missionaries in other parts of the world, mm -hmm. that that we've come to believe that we are so separated from God that He doesn't want to have a relationship with us, and yet the missio dei, the sending of God, tells us that He does want to have a relationship with us, and we see that from the very beginning as He reaches out to Adam and Eve. And, uh, and he continues that relationship. We see as Genesis, as the Genesis, Genesis narrative continues. And so that's one idea that we mm -hmm. want to, to be sure that we're communicating. The, the other is a, a Latin uh, phrase that we don't talk about all that much, and that's the modus day. I think we yep. hinted at it this mm -hmm. last time. But it's not only God sending himself. But it's God moving to people. The modus de modus is the Latin word for movement. The movement of God to people. And I think that's important uh, for us. So, so what the Missio Dei and the Modus Dei do for us in our reorientation is it helps us to see that, one, this is God's mission. And secondly, God is moving to people. And that ultimately is expressed in Christ and in the incarnation. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so then we move from the Missio Dei, the Modus Dei, to the Missio Ecclesia. What then is the mission of the church 
the sending of the church. And how does that exemplify the sending of God? Because the church, the body of Christ, the ecclesia, um, uh, is to emulate what God has done and is doing in the world as God's people. And, uh, and so that gets us then to the modus ecclesia, the sending of the church. And so it's the church going to people uh, rather than the church waiting for people to make the move to the church. And, uh, and, and those four things, I think, are so important as we're uh, on this sort, sort of journey, if you will, of innovative disruption. It's fascinating. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm thinking through all of the missios and modices and um, <laughs> that you just listed. Uh, I often, uh, I reflect some of the teaching from uh, Mike Goheen and Craig Bartholomew in the book, The Drama of Scripture. And they take um, what's often not solely attributed to N.T. Wright but kind of the the fourfold movement like there's really just four pieces of history the creation fall uh redemption restoration right the that's that's history in four parts and goheen and bartholomew say we say six <laughs> not four and and so that's the creation and then sin fall chaos whatever uh, and then what is described uh, usually missed in some of that fourfold is, or those four acts uh, is the the modus day that God is moving towards his people that the entire mm -hmm. from Genesis 3 and uh, till the start of the New Testament is the description of Jesus or God moving towards his people. What has he done through covenants to to move towards them? to continue to lean in and show who he is and what he does. And then uh, number four would be Jesus arriving, uh, coming, saving, resurrecting. And then after that is, is God sending again, but it's sending his church, hmm. right? And so it's this movement of the church towards others to declare uh, his goodness and his wonder. And then finally him coming back down to restore all creation, to restore, to recreate. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going through all of those again, because I'm listening as you're talking about this Missio Dei, Modus Dei, Missio Ecclesia and Modus Ecclesia. Um, and trying to see if I can put them in my nice little six parts that I see. But one of the things that we like doing when we talk about this is using these six symbols or six uh, pieces in the drama of scripture and putting them into symbols. So the uh, God creating, it's an arrow down, uh, the fall, an X, uh, God going towards his people, that kind of the Old Testament and the covenants, it's an arrow moving forward, right? It's this, this God, this movement of God that he is moving towards us. So the arrow forward, and then we see the cross that's number four, but then the fifth one, it's, it's the same arrow, but it's now the movement of the church who is moving into the world, just like God moved towards us. We then emulate him. And so, mm -hmm. uh, and then the last thing with recreation, it's the arrow down. Um, so it's actually two of the same symbols um, twice. But the reason I'm, I'm continuing to detail all of this, I hope that you, the listener, are not bored. Um, uh, Michael's riveted. I can tell he is just riveted. Um, but this excitement for me is that all that we were created to do and be, to be made in his image and his likeness, is seen expressed in the Missio Day and the Modus Day. And then through Christ, we actually are now fully able to live into that missio ecclesia or ecclesia and the modus ecclesia, because mm -hmm. we have been made to be in his image and in his likeness. And we are now reflecting his image and his likeness as we move forward in his glory to the world, to unite all things in Jesus, that we have this finally as, as we were always made to be. 
we get to live into this now because we've we're on this mission to reorient ourselves to Jesus and what he has meant for us. Yeah. 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 And, and that's not to say that, you know, now that there is the, the sending of the church and the movement of the church to people. And here, I want to be clear that we're talking about the church as God's people. We're not talking yes. about the institution that it's become today. And, you know, mm-hmm. there, there are some, uh, and I might be leaning this way, that think that the word church itself, it, it no longer has the, the meaning that was intended in the New Testament. Uh, we've lost that. But for the sake of what we're trying to express here, um, what we mean by church is God's people. That's us. Yeah. And together as God's people is where the true expe- expression of the ecclesia exists. Mm-hmm. Um and so, but that being said, doesn't mean that now God says, okay, I've, I've got this ecclesia, it's going out and doing the things that I did, now I'm kind yeah, of resting I'm out. back. No, God still is at work. Yeah, we're he joining him. We yeah. are joining him in his work. Yeah, yeah. And so when we talk about, you know, the sending of the church, the movement of the church to people, we have to clarify and say that that mission of the body of Christ is to discover what it is that God's doing around the world and to make that explicit. And that's what we see throughout the book of Acts. You know, Paul isn't going as some, and we were talking about this earlier, Paul's not going into the world as some entrepreneur starting something new. What he's doing is going in and revealing to people what God has been doing to move to them. And so, you know, that's what the whole book of Ephesiology is about. Um, that's what we've been talking about now for the mm-hmm. past couple of years, is here we have these beautiful examples of the early disciples revealing to the people that they're engaging the God who is already present and uh, doing it in such a way that they are able to connect with those cultures in language that those cultures understand. And so as we think about the Missio Ecclesia and the Modus Ecclesia, we always want to keep in mind that God is already at work in these places. Now our mission is to reveal that work in explicit ways. This is going to be fun. I hope that uh, that our listeners have been able to keep up. Uh, I think you and I, Michael, were both excited about so many different things that we went on a few tangents, but they did they did come very nicely back in line with where we were headed. Um, and I think we have uh, really worked well to set this foundation for where we are going to go for the rest of this series on innovative disruption. Uh, we want to thank you the listener, for joining us in our uh, pursuit in this series of innovative disruption, recalibrating our mission to the movement of God. Uh, We want to invite you, if this is your first time, to to check us out. Go back online um, to uh, masterclasses.ephesiology.com. Michael referenced the free course of Rediscovering Jesus. Is that, was that the title, Michael, Rediscovering Jesus? Rediscovering Jesus Through Revelation. There we go. That, that's why you asked the professor um, what his course is titled. He will let you know uh, as long as his brain's working, which his is today. So wonderful. Um, so go to masterclasses.ephesiology.com. Check that out. Um, as well as wherever you were listening to this podcast, uh, go and check out some past episodes. We've been doing this for over five years. So there are there is a back catalog to speak of, and I am certain that there is something there that will be a blessing to you. Uh, lastly, uh, we really do want to hear from you. So please go to our Innovative Disruption page on masterclasses.ephesiology.com and dialogue with us on this topic or any from this series because we want to make sure that we are doing theology in community together. So for Michael and myself, Thanks for joining us on the Ephesiology Podcast.